Hi, it's David Aver with the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast. So what does it take to earn a billion social media views, 1,500 TV appearances, 23 times on the Ellen DeGeneres Show, two Emmy Awards, and one Guinness World Record? Well, you don't do it by being boring. Oh, friends, it is a great show today. I am thrilled to welcome the amazing, the creative, and always brilliant and strategic Steve Spangler to the show. You may want to switch to the video version of this one. Just saying, it's David Avern on the Customer Experience Advantage podcast back in 20 seconds. You're listening to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast with David Avrin. Featuring candid conversations with some of the most influential leaders in business today. Sit back and listen in, or feel free to watch the video version online. This is the Customer Experience Advantage podcast, and here's David Averin. Hey friends, welcome to the Customer Experience Advantage podcast. I am just the luckiest guy in the world because I get to interview anybody I want. And when I do, but I always do it with an eye and an ear and a mind towards something that is valuable for my audience, for those who are entrepreneurs, those who are looking to build their business, build and win on uh, delivering and envisioning and crafting a superior customer experience. And when it comes to experiences, there are few people in the world who are more adept more accomplished, more engaging than my friend, Steve Spangler. He is, uh, he's been nominated five for five daytime Emmy Awards for his new syndicated DIY Psy, which is on Saturday mornings. It's not really new, is it now? Is it still new? Uh, no, uh, we, we signed for season, I can tell you that, we just signed for season five. So it season is five, almost six years old because that COVID kind of a year, you know, well, and, right. the but, pause. But you never change. I look at you, you are the Dick Clark of the small screen <laughs> and big stage. I'm just saying it's small screen, big stage engagement. Um, few are better if you know the, the famous experiment with the uh, Mentos in the diet code. David, I need a anything. coffee break. I Did you a need a coffee break? break? Okay, go ahead. Sorry, was this a little bit long? If you, yeah, it's just, if you, don't, if you don't mind, a little coffee break. Hey, you know what? Uh, here's the thing, before we get started, because I know we're going to talk about <laughs> Mentos and- Please. On videos and everything. Well, the problem is if, if people are listening right now and they switch to video, here's the cup of coffee and here's the thing that I've, I've figured out. The first thing is this, when you have coffee, sometimes you're bad and you add things to it. Like you put a little bit of milk in there. It's all here. Sure. Stand by, stand by. If you don't mind, a little bit of milk is probably a good thing. And then I'm trying to cut the sugar out. So, so you know, oh, that's perfect. Good. And then you try to cut the sugar out and uh, then you got to stir it. And mom said you're not supposed to use your fingers. And so that means you got to use a, a, a spoon, but that means, well, I don't really have a spoon. If you haven't guessed by now, this isn't my real kitchen. Here, take a look. This is, uh, well, this is where I've been standing for the last 15 months. And so this, this is a kitchen, it's just not mine. And the people, when they come home, are gonna be pissed. So um, here's, here, so I need to get this stirred up. And so if you're a science guy, check this out. You're always coming up with these solutions. So what you do is you go to the garage and you build this board. Now this is a board about one foot square. There's little holes on the corners and that's where you hook the rope. And the ropes kind of come up here to, to make a serving platter. You see the serving tray that's here? Now you just so take sort of, for those who are listening, coffee. Yeah, it's kind of hanging there like a pendulum, like, like a, yes. like a, what is it the the justice scales a scale yeah yeah, yeah. Like so scale here's thing. what you do we turn to isaac newton to help us solve the problem of why should you stir your coffee with a spoon it just means that you would have to number one have a spoon number two clean the spoon why not hurl it around your kitchen so here's what you do uh cup is in the very middle here and you just kind of pull it back and forth on the tray <laughs> isn't that kind of fun back and hello up and over the head up and over the head and then david <laughs> you're just going to do this you go hey, like this oh god that was a close one uh, and the crowd goes wild, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, they do. It is an amazing little, see, and, and that's just so much better than a spoon. Yeah, and or describing a spoon. Is, yeah, what's the best part about it? Is that people go, hey, 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 pause, because that's what we're all about is the pause. That's today. exactly right. Pause. Honey, get over here. Look at this idiot swinging coffee. Around. Who is that guy? I think I saw him on the Ellen show. I'm not he, sure. Next thing you know, they're Googling Steve the name. Spangler. Next that's thing good. you know, they're engaged. Next thing you know, there are two pots of coffee down and they're like, I, I got to buy this kit for the kid. I got to sign up for the subscription service. I wonder if he did. And so that silly little thing right there, as silly as it is, 
just gets people because it, 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 it's that engagement technique, right? Yeah. It makes them literally and figuratively lean in and go, what the heck is this all about? You, you know that. We've been friends for a long, long time. It's that, um, it's that age old thing. Do you use props or not? And I'm a prop guy because I try to inspire this next generation of scientists and engineers and critical thinkers. And the, I don't use words to do that. I actually use visuals. And so I've been doing it for almost 30 years. But it, but it, it's more than than the great visual. It is a metaphor, isn't it? It's what is it that gets somebody? As we talk about stopping the scroll, there's very few people who've had the background and the earliest days of the internet and YouTube and everything else. And I would love you to tell our audience about that in a second. Um, but but there are lessons in all of that for all of us. We don't all have great um, zowie wowie kinds of visuals to to glean into but there but the the lessons are universal in terms of what stops the scroll what gets somebody engaged what makes them want to look look again respond research reach out it's all part of that whole linear system isn't it uh absolutely you, you hit it on the head and i think that it, it doesn't it's not one of those things that we have to sit there and say well He's just a gimmicky guy. You know, it's comedian, stand up comics hate prop guys. You know, right. it's like, oh, I don't travel with props. I'm a purist. Great. You just work on your craft that way. And there's a hell of a lot of competition on your side because there's lots of people who are just standing and delivering. And gosh, that's great. For a prop guy like me, that's kind of a bummer because I'm schlepping around a couple things here and there. So is it an advantage? I don't know. It's just different. And I guess in today's day and age, whatever I can do to be different. So I, I would think that if you're not uh, that, that kind of person is no matter what we're talking about it is what is that point in time that's going to stop another human being uh, with everything else that's going on in the world yeah. and simply go well wait I got to listen to that it could have been a mention for something or you're listening to a podcast and somebody mentions a product or somebody mentions man this is the best app I have seen in the last two years all of a sudden I'm like duh, 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 wait I trust this person What's the best app you've ever come across in the last two years? So it's the same kind of thing. I'm just that visual kind of person that, that does these kinds of things to grab their attention. But, and always there's a lot of lessons. Probably always will be. Yeah, there's a lot of lessons in that. Um, and, and part of it is, is, the, um, is, is what is it that gets people talking about something? What is it? I, I get this question. Anybody who's in marketing or whatever gets the question, how do I get something to go viral? And I'm like, it, it's very, very simple. <laughs> just, just post something that's so interesting that somebody wants to pass it on to somebody else. And it's almost as, as basic as that. And when they say it's simple, but it's not easy, it's not because there's so much crap. There is, there is, there's a lot of, uh, I, I think, insights on, on, on human behavior and what's interesting for us. And if you want people to be interested, you have to be interesting. Take us right. back because we've learned a lot. And some of it was through pioneers like you and others as well in the earliest days of YouTube and others. As we look for lessons, we're talking to Steve Spangler here, lessons for how do we create content that is engaging? <laughs> how do we? Well, right. it's, it's, a, it's a big, me, big question, I know. It's a huge question. And let me go back to what you just said, um, which is that or those early days of what viral really is all about. I was trained as a teacher. I was an elementary science teacher. Uh, you know, the joke is always, you always wanted to have a teacher like me because the fire department shows up twice a year. You, and if you're pushing the limits a little bit, that's absolutely true. Um, and my principal, many, 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 many years ago, uh, after some little Halloween stunt that I had done, said, so did we learn a lesson uh, this time? And I said, probably not to do the exploding pumpkin in front of all the children. And she goes, no, no, that was great. And I said, well, probably should have put down the barrier for the carpet. And she goes, we'll talk about that later. She says, if it gets to the dinner table, you win. If what you do in class is so engaging, so exciting that a kid wants to share it at home when they don't have to, when they're prompted from you know mom and dad going, what'd you do in school today? And the kid goes, nothing. The kid can hardly wait to get home and go, oh, if it gets to the dinner table, you win. And it's a philosophy I've lived by forever. So I use the same kind of thing when I'm creating business content. If I can create something that people are like, wait, I gotta show that to somebody. I shouldn't be doing science experiments, Mr. Averin, on LinkedIn, but I am. Why? 
because I think it's a fun little break. I think through everything you scroll through on LinkedIn, all of a sudden you find Steve Spangler Science Minute. You go, hey, hey, Bob, take a look at this. This guy's doing something with a nail, an egg, and peanut butter. Check this out. And so, you know, it's just something weird. But guess what? It gets back home again because I see it in the comments. We go, my kids love the thing with the apple and the dowel rod and the, the hammer. What a great way to teach Newton's laws of motion, whatever it is. Um, it's that piece. And then you're, you're at the forefront of someone's mind when they're talking about engagement. And that's really what I'm doing. Science is that metaphor, and I am a science teacher, but it's really all about the science of engagement. What is it that makes people want to engage? How do I go back, lather, rinse, repeat, and see if I can get even better results the next time? So the world today it did is, not answer your question. No, it, no, it, it did. It did. But, <laughs> let, let's, but let's keep talking about it because the world today is very different than it was 10, 15 years ago when all of this was started. I mean, the iPhone's been around, what, 12, 13 years now. The competition for the eyes and ears is fierce. The stakes have never been higher. But the rewards for those who do this well can be spectacular. And, yeah. and, and there are no shortage of those that fall by the wayside. Is there a formula or is it just keep revising the formula or is it just a, an, intu an intuitive sense of what we like that we hope other people like? I think it's a little bit of all. And I can tell you that from some sense of experience because we'll put out something, for example, and the next thing you know, there are 10 versions of that same thing that are presented differently or maybe the same exact way that we did it, but there's different tribes all over. And, you know, I'll do something that I think has done fairly well and in the hands of somebody else who's got, you know, uh, you know 8 million or 10 million followers, well, it just explodes. And so do you get mad about it? No, not really, because uh, hopefully the people who are following me and wanting to be a part of the experience I'm creating Part of it is the thing that I'm showing it, and part of it is the way I'm doing it. So, you know, it's like uh, a lot of people sing New York, New York, but Frank Sinatra probably sang it the best. So if I really right. want a version of that, I think I'm gonna go listen to the Frank Sinatra version, or I mean, how many different covers do you have to have of Billy Joel's songs every time you're at a wedding, for God's sakes? I remember listening to a podcast with Billy Joel going, they just, they seem like they have to play the songs that I've written when right. I'm at Don't the wedding go reception. He says, <laughs> yeah. he says, finally, no. I have to go up to the guy and go, hey, uh, thanks so much for playing the song, but that's not the way it was written. Let me show you. There's a slide here. And so you slide into it this way. And he says, it's just so funny. Where am I going with all of this? I think that's one, one part of it is the person. There's just a reason why I just want to hang around Dave Avern. Makes you feel good. Uh, it's, it has great insights. He's just a fun guy to kind of hang around. Then he also has some, uh, some really good content and some other things. I need some business stuff. But it, I think it was Nito Cobain that said, uh, if all you have is information, people use and discard you. If what you have is knowledge, they only come to you when they need you. But if you have wisdom, then you have respect, right? right. And so it's but, kind of but, that, but there's a how fourth do you get to one that point too. where whatever you say. Right, but there's a fourth one today, which is surrounding vanity metrics. And there are those things, I, I remember saying on stage 10 years ago, that when I was talking about marketing and all that, I said, who, who wants to be on TV tonight? And I like, let's see hands. Who wants to be on TV? And I said, good, take off your pants, hang from the viaduct. But what's it going to do for you? There's a lot of vanity <laughs> metrics online right now. Or here's, here's the other one. Here's another crude example. You know, you can put something outrageous online, get it passed around or whatever else. But if it doesn't connect to your business or lead something back, my old boss used to say, when you do that, it's like peeing in your pants. It'll give you a really warm feeling for a minute, but it's not going to do you much good in the long run. So talk to me about the strategy. Tip your waitress. He'll be here all there week, ladies and gentlemen. Tip your waitress. That's Try the veal. No, all right, strategy. Let's, let's, let's talk about but, but talk strategy, strategy behind it because there is, yes, it's engaging. It's interesting. Somebody wants to pass it, but there is a long vision uh, of, of where this needs to go to justify your time. Very successful. One of the greatest speakers, your dear friend, but you're also one of the greatest speakers I've ever seen on stage. Really engaging, really funny. But the things that you do on that small screen lead to inquiries that help people build businesses. Talk about that. I think it's stuff that we've learned uh, along the way and people can see it uh, as well and, and through their own actions. Uh, there's almost 1800 YouTube videos and you don't put out 1800 YouTube videos without learning something. And it was in 2010 that we were approached by Google, YouTube, um, and they were creating their original content series. 
And so they were out there trying to find people who could create content. At the time, the average person in the world watched YouTube two minutes and 21 seconds a day. Uh, of course, for world domination, I think YouTube wanted 20 minutes a day. So how in the world do you get somebody to go from two minutes and 21 seconds to about 20 minutes? So they funded a very expensive experiment. They went out and found 100 players. And who would have ever guessed that a science teacher from Littleton, Colorado would get funded? And we did. And the, the whole thing that they said was, could you just create weekly content? And we want you to try to get to that 20 minute mark. And we're just going to look at engagement. And I said, okay, so how do you measure that? Kind of like comments, probably the number of comments on the video. Yeah. And what I found out was they don't care about comments. You know what they, I'm sorry. Yeah, I thought that they were looking at a num total number of views. Mm -hmm. What they were looking for was comments. And on the back side, when did somebody click off? Okay, so two things that are there. Comments, extremely important. So, sorry, I said the wrong thing, thinking about uh, um, just the total number of views. Right, got it. Uh, and secondly, and secondly, How long did they watch when did it? they turn off? Yeah. Well, I was losing, so, so they funded a project called the Spangler Effect. So in 2010, we launched the Spangler Effect, uh, kind of an open, that's currently the TV show now. I mean, DIY Sci is basically the Spangler Effect from years ago. Sure. Um, just with a full production team and, and its syndication behind us, right? And um, they, as we looked at it, we had these wonderful, I thought at the beginning, wonderful shows. I thought they were well written. There was a fancy graphic open and whatever else. I was losing the audience as early as 23 seconds into it. And by losing the audience, the metric was, I had lost 60% of the audience in the first 23 seconds. So you go back and you look at it and you go, so what did I do that was so offensive in the first 23 seconds? And it was, oh, I was not engaging and I didn't make it about them. I made it about me. That open was all about me. It's like our sizzle reels that we use. It's like anybody in business going, look at how great it is. Look at how great my siding is. Look at how great my financial portfolio. Look at all, instead of going, hey, guess what? You're gonna lose all your money in the next six months and I've got a way for you to be able to protect it with the things that are gonna happen. Well, now you got my attention. So the right. same thing happened for me. Instead of having the sizzle reel, it was Steve Spangler blows stuff up. He can crush a tanker. He drops slime from a building and all that kind of stuff. It was, um, hey, check this out. Using the power of your mind, I can crush this soda can. No, no, seriously, I'm going to show you how to do something that will guarantee amaze your friends. Stick with me. It's all about the power of air. And so people are like, what? And then all of a sudden, you can roll that open if you want with a skip intro, but you, you keep them because as soon as I go beyond the what's in it for me kind of principle, as soon as I go, I taught you how to crush a, a soda can, now I'm going to teach you how to crush this bigger can, now I'm going to teach you how to use the power. As soon as you get to the point where you go, mm, I don't have any of those, click, uh, it's done. I already got what I needed from you and I will use you and discard you. Was that so the genesis of was, using your own stuff in the, in the kitchen and everything else that everybody had? Make it user-friendly. Uh, no, the genesis of that was a wonderful uh, conversation that I had with Don Herbert, who's the original Mr. Wizard. When I got my first gig on NBC uh, in the 1990s, it was on a show called uh, News for Kids. Uh -huh. um, I reached out pre-internet to a guy by the name of Don Herbert. I had all of his books, the original Mr. Wizard. I found him, actually picked up the phone, talked to me, funny, funny guy, since then became good friends. Uh, and, and I think passed away probably in 2010, 2012 around there. But what he told me in the early 90s was, I said, do you have any suggestions for me? I got this little gig and they're kind of like saying, maybe you could be like Mr. Wizard in 1991. And his exact words were, don't let the bastards put you in a lab coat. Honest to God, that's exactly what he said. And, and I thought, Mr. Wizard, what did you just say? And he goes, Lab coat's a character, this kind of thing, just loud. Lab coat's a character. I'm not in a lab coat. I was in a sweater. And for anybody listening right now, you know that's true. Yeah. He, he didn't wear a lab coat. Mr. Wizard was in a sweater. I'm not in a lab. I'm in a, I'm in a garage. Uh, that's that's actually true. A pretty nice garage. And he goes, and I don't use those damn beakers. Beakers. <laughs> I was going to go uh, there. I, 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 use, I use mason jars. Why? Because kids got them. And he says, the more accessible you can make it, the more likely they are to try it. 
And then you look through your old Mr. Wizard stuff and you see he's teaching kids how to cook a hot dog by taking lamp cord and stripping off the ends of the wires and jamming <laughs> it into the end of a hot dog and sticking it into the side of the, you know, so there, there's a certain line that's there. But the principle what made a whole lot of sense, it was use things that are accessible and people will try to recreate it. And the second thing he taught me is never let the gee whiz overtake the content, which I thought was really important. Say that never again let the, and what explain is, it. Never let the gee whiz overtake the content. So you can swing the coffee around the kitchen and this is great and dance and spin the plates, but if there's not purpose behind it, yeah. and you're not using it for a reason, then you wasted people's time getting their attention, right? And I think we do it in business all the time. I think we work so hard to get people's attention. And once we've got it, we don't know what to do with it. You know, you know what we do is we work so hard to get them to our websites. Guess what the first thing we do is we plaster our social media icons all over that website. And then what? Then we send them to Twitter or Facebook that we haven't posted at for a year. And now all of a sudden they find other top financial planners, other top motivational speakers who are more engaging than us, better looking, uh, younger, whatever it is. So I think we work really hard to try to get people's attention. And, and so that's exactly what I'm trying to do here. And I can tell you that I just learned from this piece of it as a teacher. Now, this is me speaking as a teacher. Yeah. I had forgotten that it's my job to get a kid's attention and I'm damn good at getting a kid's attention. There's no question about it, but where I was really lacking was making sure that there was to bring it home to make sure that the gee whiz didn't overtake the content. The reason boys and girls were walking on broken glass today is that we're learning about physics. And if you like physics and structural things, there's a job waiting for you that we've yet to invent. It's 15, 20 years out. It's all about wonder, discovery and exploration. It'll pay you phenomenally well and you'll be happy if you like it, you just got to keep following this path. And that was the sale. And I had forgotten to be a business person as a teacher to sell the idea that we need scientists and engineers 15 to 20 years down the road. Yeah. So let me, let me take you back to the, this, and these are perfect tangents because they're, they're fascinating. Now I want to go back to the, what you learned in terms of when you lost your audience, when they came back, because I think you make a really, really good point. People can do outrageous things. We've got colleagues who do outrageous things that have nothing to do with their business, but they have these vanity metrics that make them feel great because they got lots of likes. Or you get sucked in to the headline, some clickbait, and then you've watched something for four minutes at the end, you realize there is a, a, a BS payoff or none whatsoever. And then it's bombarded by waste of time comments. Oh, you promised this, but didn't do it. So it's not right. just learning about the engagement and holding them. But you were also pretty confident that once you got them past the 45 second mark or whatever that was, they were going to like what they saw. And you were committed to doing that, right? Make sure that the, that the, the promise met the, the deliverable. Yep. Uh, you're very astute. Mr. Haverin, um, what I learned was this, it's what every business person doesn't want to hear because I think every business person wants lather, rinse, repeat. You learn the process and you just keep doing it more and more, you get greater mass, uh, greater momentum, that kind of thing. Scale, Here's what I learned. Yeah. The YouTube audience is very different than the next social media audience that we entered. And before I was doing YouTube, it was very different than just the regular network TV audience who was sending an email, uh, not email, uh, actual mail, you know, which is different right. than our audience that's on stage. So I have to learn to, uh, to uh, put out a frequency and energy information that resonates that particular audience. For that YouTube audience watching the Spangler effect that we gained probably, I don't know, half million to a million followers uh, on that particular show and, and great views, but that audience wanted it all about them. As soon as I went away from all about them, then they clicked off and we could prove that by that little experiment that we did. So I could, if I wanted to engage people for three and a half minutes, I knew I could do that by just making it about them. Use simple material, show them how to do that. Another variation. This is cool. As soon as they go, now let's go outside and blow up a tanker. People would go, thank you, but no thanks. And you'd think that that's the best part. It has been so hard to try to convince television producers that that formula works. 
but slowly with DIY Sci, and again, a tiny little show, but um, it has a good following because people know that if they tune in, this is stuff that they can do at home. We're not going to make it too outrageous. So that focus is there. I just always constantly watch it and say, at what point will the audience disconnect? You do it as a speaker, we do it on television. We're now doing it on social media. My Facebook audience, way, way different than the YouTube audience and yeah. the TikTok audience, and LinkedIn, hugely different. different. And yeah, and it's just trying. I don't know. I'm just trying this LinkedIn thing as a challenge. I had zero followers, zero likes, zero views, zero everything. May of 2020 when it comes to TikTok. And they reached out and they said, would you like to be a part of this education project that we're doing? And I go, do I really look like TikTok material? And first of all, I don't sing to and I'm not doing this thing and whatever else that you do on <laughs> TikTok. And they go, maybe right. the platform's for something else. Could you teach something? And I said, yeah, if I had three to five minutes and they laughed and they go, you don't know TikTok. And I go, no, I'm 53. So I, I don't know the TikTok yet. And, uh, and they said, you have 59 seconds, 59 seconds. Could you do it? So he took the challenge, you know, could we do 30 videos or what was it Higgins, 40 videos in 30 days, something like that, but just a concentrated effort every day, you kind of put some, and does it work? A million followers after those 40 days. So that was cool. Um, we just had to learn what those people wanted and watch their reviews, watch their comments. How did they interact? Feed them more of what they want, right? Salespeople call it meta, what, meta-ing or something like that? I don't right. know what, uh, say should be a sales trainer someday. Right. But, no, but, I but, but that's uh, the answer, isn't it though? Is, is listening to your audience, watching the analytics. It, not, there was a time I remember back in the day, way back, cause I'm older than you are, but we used to say all the time that we know that half every business, I know half my advertising dollars are wasted. I just don't know which half, right? Today we know. Today we know, we have the analytics. Your audience will tell you, they'll tell you by, by their engagement, they'll tell you by their absence. They'll tell you by the comments and you combine that with the analytics. So just like right. a Tiger Woods or anybody else who's always has their own coach um, and they're always learning and always getting better, even if they're, even if they're at the top of their game, you're always learning and trying something new because what worked five years ago may not work anymore. Yep. And it's this giant experiment. And unfortunately for somebody who is a, I'm trying to to teach people to look at business through the eyes of a scientist, right? Through the lens of science, how do you look at your business? The problem is that there are more variables today than ever before. Right. And so I can take the same video. So I had this clever little video about how to take an egg and to uh, turn it into this geode. So these crystals would grow inside of an eggshell, whatever. A pretty simple thing to do. Um, so I decided to put it out around Easter because people are doing egg things, whatever. On Facebook, blew up 4.3 million views on Facebook. So it was crazy. Posted the same exact day on my uh, YouTube channel that is doing really, really well. In fact, better than Facebook. Probably got 100,000 views. And Instagram wasn't even around at that time. Went back, tried that whole experiment again three, four years later. Yeah, kind of meh uh, across the board. Uh, but resonated really, really well this time on Instagram because we tried to shorten it a little bit, change it a little bit, couldn't just repurpose that same content, had to share it again. So it's not, I wish there was a formula that says, well, it's just people who don't get it, right? Uh, there could be part of that, but then there's that last little metric that's just there saying, I know this is good content what can I do to present it a little bit differently and feed it out again and see what happens with only 17% of the people seeing whatever we put on our social media feeds or, you know, it's probably even less than or that less, now, but yeah. you know, whatever, whatever Jay Bear was talking about, you know, a year ago or so, um, I can put it out again. I can disguise it, put it out again, put it out again, put it out again. And all of a sudden it resonates, but to what end, what am I trying to get people to do? Um, trying to get them to, to figure out or knock glasses over. Or I'm just trying to get them to engage to the point where they go, wait, wait, when they think of science and they think of getting their kids excited about science, uh, providing professional development for teachers, those things that I do, I just want to be top of mind. Yeah. But Relevant for, and top of mind. For, for business audiences, once again, talking to Steve Spangler. If you want to learn more about him, you can look him up at stevespangler.com. I would say just go on YouTube search Steve Spangler and, uh, and you'll get a real good sense of what he does, but there is, is a real strategy behind it. What, what's the criteria you use in terms of, of deciding what to, when to chase good money after bad, what, what is worth 
continued attention to something that might potentially build. Uh, clearly different strategies for a TikTok or an Instagram or a Twitter or YouTube or Facebook. For people who say, I don't have the bandwidth for everything, first of all, is it true? Um, and, and what's the payoff and what's the criteria? And um, while you're at it, tell me about world peace and um, yeah, yeah and <laughs> split the atom. And split the atom. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> say, yeah. Too many questions. I know, but um, but, but no. I, how do you, how do you yeah, gauge the I success? I think depression sets in. <laughs> so let's just be really honest. That's when depression sets in because the next thing comes around and you're like, just when I had really this one figured out. Yeah. yeah, I just, okay, do I really want to do TikTok? And the bottom line is, well, yeah, because if you've been in this business at all, you look at it and go, mm, yep, there's momentum behind here. Uh, yep, I could do this. And the only way, now we're going to do science. Are you ready? Yeah. The only way that you get to momentum, you ready for this formula? Momentum equals mass times velocity. That's as hard as it gets, okay? Momentum equals mass times velocity. What is velocity? Velocity is speed with direction. So you remember when you're in high school physics class, they'd always say you're going uh, 50 miles an hour and they'd put an arrow and they'd say in this direction. Well, that's velocity from a business standpoint, super, super important because there's lots of businesses out there that have, well, they have speed, but they don't have velocity because they don't have direction. They don't have leadership. They're doing stuff. You walk in there and you go, wow, this is crazy. And there's just stuff going on all of it, but there's no direction, right? So there's that little leadership piece. Once you get velocity figured out, now the mass part is just lather, rinse, repeat. You do it again, you do it again, you do it again. And all of a sudden, now you got momentum. Now, and it's hard to slow down momentum, right? So when you figure out the formula that's working for you, just don't, as we'd say in the teaching world, laminate your lesson plans, right? Don't right. laminate or, or inscribe in stone. This is how this business works. No, no, this is how it works now but it's going to change. So just realize let's ride that wave for a while. I know I'm not going to make the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars a day that some of these YouTubers are making that the Instagrammers that are making the TikTokers. but you know what, for my market, I just am looking for an event planner who sees me and says, wow, you have this following on TikTok and your engagement strategies are interesting. Would you come and speak at our conference, right? Or yeah. it's a superintendent of a large school district going, we've got a problem with engagement and teachers. We really could use your help in doing that. And those are the platforms. So when do you start throwing money after? You just have to have the goal in mind. If you just wanna be famous, I guess you just start putting stuff out there and tell people, and then what do you get, like you say, with that? If I'm just trying to get somebody's attention, ultimately to get the phone to ring, to start a conversation. So it's just, it's really an engagement starter more than anything else with visibility. And then the second thing is I got to answer the phone. And it's amazing today how, Dave, you do the same thing oh. with you. People connect with you on all these platforms. So go ahead, throw your hat in the TikTok ring. You better respond because somebody pretty important will DM you. We got an influencer campaign here recently. Can't tell you about it right now, but I will in a couple of weeks. So uh, got an influencer campaign that came from TikTok and they reached out as a DM or a, you know, whatever it is with TikTok, a message that way. You're thinking really the head of this big agency would reach out that way. They just want to see if you're engaged. Are you, if you're playing in that arena, do you really react? So, yeah. Beyond brilliant. Give me the last thing before, before we're done here. Give me, uh, what derails professionals what derails organizations is it just a lack of consistency is it that it's the shiny new object and they get really excited and they stop posting after a week and they give up too early or is it the quality of the content they're 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 sharing i i if you put all those things together that's just another way of saying they just didn't understand the scientific method when they were a kid they didn't understand the experimental process. They don't go into it with, so here's the hypothesis. I think, hey team, gather around. I think if we do this, and with my leadership skills, I'm just gonna say for this period of time, and we don't change this, but let's do this, and then let's gather evidence, all the, so you've got the metrics coming in, you've got the information coming in, 
Then let's evaluate it and say, what did we learn? Not a conclusion yet, right? That's where science people fail, is we taught kids this. Uh, here's your science project, uh, hypothesis, do the experiment, gather the data, write a conclusion. Well, most people don't even have enough data to ever write a conclusion. It's a good experiment if during the discovery phase you go, hey guys, kind of saw an uptick over here. Let's go back and do it again for this period of time. Let's commit it because I think it's working. Let's try this, boom, 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 boom. And walk through that experimental process until you finally have enough data to come back and go, yep, I think I'm going to wrap this up. This one didn't work or no, I think I got something there. And I was listening to, um, I don't know, comedians in cars getting coffee or whatever, the Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah, yeah. And I'm trying to remember who he is interviewing, but it was his insight. Somebody asked him, uh, how long do you do a joke until you take it out of the act? And he says, probably a good five times maybe a little bit more. He says, if I can deliver it consistently, now if I'm off one night or I say the line differently, it doesn't count. But if I can consistency, consistently deliver it five times and I get a meh kind of response, he says, I'll take it out. And he says, there's times I've just kept it in and it's just a groaner. And if you're good enough, I guess you can have a couple groaners for yourself because it makes you smile. But it is that, that um, commitment to the scientific process, so to speak, of do the same thing over and over and over, make the discovery and make that decision. That way you're not chasing your tail. And I think it's, it puts discipline with the employees who are around you saying, this is the process we use for testing everything. And, right. well, uh, I, well, I think, and I think it, it gives credibility. Mindset is good. Yeah, credibility internally as well. I mean, I think far too many people give up too fast. Far too many have had a bad experience with a social media firm or something else. I spent all of this money. I don't even know what I got for it. And then they're twice shy. I love the idea of fail fast and make those revisions and keep working along the way. Listen, we could talk forever and we will again because there's so much that we didn't even get into. And, and but I love watching your journey. I love watching your kids grow. <laughs> but um, but but the journey of just even recently. We got to tell people, Dave, wait, wait, just a second. We got to post yes. a picture somehow. You you are my my oldest son's basketball coach. I have pictures on they Facebook were four of years Averin old as the basketball. Co they were four years old. They were chasing anything <laughs> around that. David was like, come here, guys. And this is his true testament as a leader. If you can lead four years old you're a pretty effective leader and uh, watching him out there and that's oh, kind different. of the first well they didn't know what they were they, go, they like, had no speaker, idea speaker. yeah they had no idea that yeah. i didn't know what i was talking about and now your kid and my kid have both graduated from college which is pretty amazing and then our other kids as well amazing. for another another conversation once again i said it before but i'll let you say it if they want to learn more about steve spangler and all of the media things that you're doing and what you've done before how do they get in touch with you on almost all social, it's just at Steve Spangler. So you can check that out on all social, or of course you can go to the website, stevespangler.com. That's it. All right, hang on for a second. We'll talk to you on the other side. This podcast is sponsored in part by my initiative, the Customer Experience Advantage Morning Huddle. You know, some of the most innovative solutions to your biggest customer facing challenges, they're likely found within the creative minds of your own people. Let me contribute to your morning huddle conversation with your team. You can learn more about membership in this powerful global initiative. We're in four languages now by visiting customerexperienceadvantage.com. All of my books are on Amazon, including my brand new book. There it is. I have to put it at the right angle so you can see it here called The Morning Huddle. Powerful customer experience conversations to wake you up, shake you up, and win more business. Be sure to click to like this podcast, subscribe. And of course, as Steve said, the most important thing is leave your comments below. Click the little bell icon to receive notifications of new episodes. You can learn more about my keynote speaking and consulting at davidavern.com. You can learn about Steve Spangler's speaking at stevespangler.com. Oh, we're going to do some. Just you should watch this fire. on video, just don't you think? Fire, think? please. Fire. Bam! Yes. What do you think about that? Yes. That's a nice way Steve to finish Spangler. the old... Yes. All right, we got to go. Yes. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast. Check out past episodes. Leave your comment. Big thanks to my guest, Steve Spangler. I'm David Averin. Be good. This has been the Customer Experience Advantage Podcast with David Averin. Feel free to leave a comment and be sure to hit the thumbs up button. You can listen to past episodes and be notified of future ones by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. David's popular marketing and customer experience books are available in print, as well as Kindle and audiobook, and published in multiple languages around the world. You can stay connected and learn more at davidaverin.com. Thanks for tuning in.